por asistir al seminario del día de hoy. El día de hoy, el doctor Jens Figlus nos presentará el seminario titulado Flux Risk Mitigation Hybrid Coastal Structures, Physical and American Modeling of Storm Impact on a Core Enhanced Dunes. El doctor Figlus es investigador asociado en el Departamento de Ingeniería Oceánica en Texas A&M University. Él lidera el Laboratorio de Ingeniería Costera en el campus de Galveston y participa en diferentes centros e institutos como el Institute for a Disaster Resilience Texas. Obtuvo su maestría y doctorado en Ingeniería Civil por la Universidad de Delaware y sus líneas de investigación están principalmente enfocadas en el estudio de procesos en sistemas costeros y el diseño de soluciones para la reducción del riesgo tanto de inundación como erosión costera. Ha recibido varios reconocimientos a lo largo de su trayectoria y actualmente se encuentra realizando eh, una estancia de, años, de año sabático en Alemania. Eh, agradecemos mucho al doctor Figlus por haber aceptado nuestra invitación y le cedemos la palabra. Thank you, Jens, for being here today with us and you can start the seminar. Okay. Thank you, Alec, for the invitation. Thanks, everybody, for joining online. Um, my name is Jens Fieglus, as uh, Alec uh, explained, and I'll, uh, well, spend the next 40 minutes or so um, sharing with you some thoughts, some research on a, uh, a topic that has become uh, fairly uh, relevant to us in, in Texas and I think is, is important for, for many coastlines that are battling, uh, of course, erosion, Um, inundation during storm surge and wave attack um, and and you know continue to uh, try to uh, somehow fortify coastal areas um, without necessarily creating simply uh, sea walls and concrete structures so the the topic is uh, flood risk mitigation through hybrid structures and uh, I'll share my thoughts on on hybrid structures explain what they are um, how they could be used and you know explain some ongoing research on those um, specifically i'll focus on physical modeling of of these systems today in this talk but i'll also give a, a bit of an outlook on the on some of the numerical investigations that we're we're doing um, i am a, an associate professor in the department of ocean engineering at texas a m university and uh, run the coastal engineering laboratory on our galveston campus um, of that department. Um, I'm currently broadcasting from uh, Germany to you where I am on sabbatical. Um, I'm about seven hours ahead of you guys. Um, so if you hear some uh, kids screaming uh, in, a, in a little while, that could just be because they're hungry and, uh, and want some dinner. Um, but like I said earlier to Alec, please feel free to uh, interrupt, um, you know, turn on your microphone and, and ask questions throughout the talk. Um, if not, I'll make sure I'll reserve plenty of time at the end to uh, answer all your questions that you may have. Um, so with that, uh, let me point out the, the image on the right. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of an accidental hybrid structure, as, as I uh, call it, or a core enhanced dune where by accident or over time, sand had been uh, perched over a a rubble mound or a relic seawall. And this combination of sand and, and hard structure inside actually performed really well compared to some just natural dunes um, uh, along the coastline of New Jersey during, during Hurricane Sandy or Tropical Storm Sandy uh, that hit that area. So this kind of prompted a lot of the, uh, the investigation that I'll, I'll talk about today. Um, so just to give you a a schematic or a cartoon, really what we're, what we're trying to think about here is uh, we're thinking of an engineered dune system, um, uh, which is basically, it looks like a dune, it feels like a dune, it, it has sand like a dune, but ultimately inside it has a, a hard core. In this case, I drew a, a rubble mount, but it can be anything else. It can be a, a seawall or a, a clay dike or whatever you can think of essentially, and, and that combination I call the, the hybrid structure in this talk. Now, if we have severe storm attack, um, the whole system is impacted by, uh, you know, increased water levels, uh, wave erosion of the, uh, the sediment um, that makes up the dune or the sand layer, 
Um, you can have wave overtopping and sediment overwash, um, and things basically behave to some extent similar as a dune, and then to some extent similar to a coastal structure that gets uh, impacted. And we're trying to investigate how this combination can be dealt with. So just a, a brief outline uh, you'll see at the top of the screen uh, that I'll go through some introduction uh, material and explain in, in detail the motivation for this type of work. Um, I'll explain some of the methods uh, that we, we're using and continue to use to investigate. Um, and then I'll share some results. Some are preliminary, some are uh, have already been uh, included in some publications. And then I'll, I'll spend some time on discussing what all this means and how this could be uh, used in, in future work as well. Um, in the introduction, I'll I'll explain to you in a little more detail the, the marriage essentially of this uh, hard structure and, and sand dune concept or this hybrid concept. Um, and then I'll move on to explaining the motivation. Why am I even looking at this? Um, the need that we have specifically, and I'll show this to you on, on the uh, Houston Galveston coastal system where we're uh, dealing, of course, with lots of hurricane impacts and, and uh, increases in sea level rise that will you know, make some some system to protect against storm surge necessary in the in the near future. Uh, I'll highlight some existing knowledge gaps and, and also some questions that I'm, I'm trying to answer over the course of my, my uh, research. Um, I'll specifically focus on the physical model experiments, both in, in uh, sediment wave flumes as well as uh, 3D wave basins that we've uh, done, but I'll also uh, share with you some uh, numerical modeling um, results also in the in the next section here. Specifically, what the results will entail is uh, some equations for average and instantaneous wave overtopping over these these structures, which is something that we've we've tried to uh, evaluate. Uh, we'll look at how these sand profiles evolve, what's different compared to real dunes, how can these things be used in actual storm surge suppression or flood risk reduction systems. And uh, I'm, I'm sharing with you some results of our Houston Galveston concept uh, based on, on seashore model results. And then we'll have some time to uh, discuss take home messages for you and future outlook on, on these type of systems. All right, with that being said, let me jump right into kind of the introduction and then also motivation for this, this whole uh, idea. You can kind of follow along at the top here as to where we are in the, in the grand scheme of the talk. Um, you can see a couple images here. On the left, there's two images of soft coastal defenses, mainly nourishments or dunes um, that fall under this category. And on the right side, you have uh, traditional hard coastal defenses, whether these are rubble mounds type structures with individual armor units or uh, you know, gravity-based seawalls, uh, those sort of things like the seawall in Galveston here that is near our campus. Um, and we're trying to marry those. So to do that, we basically have to understand what are the principles of designing with engineered sand dunes? What is important? What do we need to know? And the main thing really is to understand the, uh, the evolution or the morphodynamics over the short term, say during storm impacts, but also over the long term. How do these things behave um, under certain conditions? Um, and designing engineered sand dunes basically has to account for a bunch of things like surge level during storm impact. So uh, that, of course, involves a lot of statistics and return intervals uh, of certain uh, you know, water levels significant wave heights, and we need to know initial dune profiles and also the sediment that we're dealing with because that obviously determines how dunes uh, erode and move. Um, duration of storms becomes important because we need to know how long can a, a engineered dune basically withstand a storm impact. So it's really important to understand the evolution during a storm but then also in the long term, you know, are there many storms before something can be repaired? This it becomes important. Often, you know, physical model experiments, process-based numerical models are, are used to evaluate dune evolution and then also ultimately design the proper systems. Now let's jump to the other side, the, the structural or coastal structures that we want to incorporate into our dune systems. Um, one of the critical 
elements that usually is designed for is a wave overtopping discharge. So how much water during a uh, design event actually goes over the structure and then ultimately floods the backside or erodes the backside of the, the structure um, or creates damage or, or flooding on the backside. Um, and that's very closely tied obviously to the forcing conditions from waves and water levels and such, but also the crest level of the structure that the waves have to run up uh, over and then produce a, a flow rate over the, the crest of the, um, the elevated crest. Um, if you are familiar with structural or coastal structure design, there's plenty of formulations to get to an overtopping value or design rate. Uh, the example on the left is kind of uh, the classic uh, example of a non-dimensional wave overtopping formula. Um, something like this is also in, included in, in a bunch of publications um, and, and usually it looks like the graph that I show on the right where you have some functional relationship between a relative freeboard, so the distance between the uh, water level during design and the elevation of the crest and that includes also some wave height and other parameters that are related to the um, either geometry of the structure or the uh, the uh, uh, type of, of wave forcing that you uh, that you can have and the curves lo usually look like this they get you know come closer together to kind of an expected value as the relative freeboard reduces meaning once there's more overtopping and more critical flow over the structure. Um, the other way this is usually done is through basically neural network type analysis where examples from the field and from uh, laboratory studies are basically packaged into a essentially lookup table. So if you have a, to design something with a similar situation, you can basically say, oh, we're we're kind of in the range of what this structure did during a uh, wave impact, and then we can deduce an overtopping rate, for example. So uh, just as a, as a brief background, I don't want to go too much into the details of, of stru coastal structure overtopping because that can fill the whole lecture, but I just wanted to kind of show you what kind of approaches we're trying to marry together here. Now, as to the motivation for these hybrid structures and even looking at something like this, um, we're always in need for innovative solution for coastal flood risk reduction. Um, and we know uh, from many publications and, and uh, that you know people like to live along the coast. People uh, will just flock to the coastal cities if they can. There's economies there, there's the beauty of nature there, uh, obviously. So there's a lot of factors that, um, that drive people to the coast. And then we have sea level rise issues and the constant threat of storms, you know, wiping out homes and, and livelihoods, industries, um, you name it. And this is just an example here on the right of sea level rise curves, different predictions and so on and so forth. Um, on the bottom left, um, I'm kind of giving you a, a quick outlook of what it is like in uh, uh, on the other side of the Gulf. Um, my campus is right here on the island behind Galveston Island. The Houston is up to the left, top left corner. Here, this whole body of water is Galveston Bay. Um, and this dotted white line and the solid white line are basically um, an over 100 kilometer stretch of coastal protection system that is currently being envisioned and designed and created. Uh, for this this whole area to protect Galveston, Bolivar Peninsula, the Galveston Bay, and of course all the heavy industry along the Galveston Bay and the city of Houston. Um, and I'll speak a little more to that system, but that was part of the reason also why I've started looking into these hybrid structures because uh, it, it may be a viable alternative for this part of the world to uh, protect against storm surge. Why? Um, well, you know, Hurricane Ike happened um, in uh, 2008, and these are just some images from the devastation left behind from that hurricane. is widely published uh, and basically uh, an eye opener for many people in in our area, in and around Houston, that something needs to be done to prevent such catastrophic failures and losses uh, in the future. You can see Galveston Island burning houses, flooding. You can see oil leaks uh, everywhere. You can see all sorts of devastation here. 
On the right, you can see, uh, you know, a uh, tidal slide, if you will, from a, uh, a collaboration between TU Delft and Texas A&M University, where we try to conceptualize what kind of system could help prevent such devastating effects in the in the future. And it's we call the coastal spine or Ike Dyke based on the hurricane name, and it would include a whole bunch of components. All the red components, which are the longest stretch, would be some sort of dune or hybrid dune or coastal structure system um, that would basically provide enough elevation that storm surge cannot enter Galveston Bay and cause internal setup and damage a whole lot of, uh, you know, livelihoods in, in the process. And then the black component here is the seawall in Galveston that already exists, and the blue component are structural gates essentially through the ship channel to block them that off as a storm approach. So what I'm going to talk about, the hybrid or core enhanced dune systems are basically an option for all the red components of this project. So you can kind of see the huge extent of, of what would be uh, needed here. Now, just uh, in October last year, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, published their uh, second draft of a feasibility report for the Texas Coastal Study that includes what should be done for the Houston Galveston region. And they come up with a, a very nice report, multiple lines of defense on the Texas coast and a, and a budget and all that kind of stuff. It's all available uh, for uh, uh, the public to see online. But essentially, um, in, they have gates uh, that they propose to close and they have uh, improvements to the Galveston seawall, basically making it a little higher. They want to create a ring around Galveston Island and on the peninsula to the uh, east and the rest of the island of Galveston to the west, they want to include beach and dune systems. This is the reason I put this here, uh, so you get an idea. And what they propose right now is basically a dual dune system, natural dune, um, for this entire stretch of the red line that I showed you earlier in the image. And you can kind of see a cross section of the proposed system. And uh, I'm very happy they, they look at natural dunes to help reduce storm surge risk. And But if you look at the elevation, this is 12 foot of the first dune, and this is above um, NAVD 88, which is very close to mean sea level, um, and then uh, 14 foot the second dune. So they're tiny. They're tiny dunes. Um, and if uh, you, know, you think about a hurricane that essentially has just a surge elevation of 12 foot easily, um, those will be wiped out, and, and modeling has shown that as well. But people would like to see the ocean, um, and obviously that's a, in stark contrast to the surge protection function that these dunes are supposed to have. So our work, uh, you know, in some extent was uh, initiated by wanting to show what actually happens if these natural dunes get wiped out. And maybe there is a way to still keep them, you know, not too high, uh, or too massive in volume, but incorporate some hard structure inside. So you can still get the look and the ecological function of a dune, but also with the uh, increased flood level protection from the core inside. Um, anyway, so this is just kind of still under motivation why you know I think uh, looking at these hybrid sy dune systems is, is important. And there's a bunch of examples from around the world where they are employed in flood risk reduction mitigation right now. There's a in Nordwijk in the Netherlands, uh, a dike and dune concept that works really well. In Katwijk, just up the coast in the Netherlands, the same thing. They have a dike underneath a dune system. Here you can see on the right when it was constructed. They even put a parking garage in it as a multifunctional use concept. So uh, it and it, it works uh, fairly well and provides aesthetics as well as flood protection essentially. Uh, but there's other examples. You remember the uh, the top left picture from uh, the rock wall in, in New Jersey from my title slide. And then around the US or other places, there are hybrid dune constructions underway or already implemented. Uh, here's one in Hawaii protecting infrastructure. And there's one at the bottom uh, core enhanced dune in Virginia where they're protecting an uh, army installation with it. And then uh, another dike and dune construction in uh, in the Netherlands as well. So there is, of course, some data and numerical investigations um, out there that 
if you're interested in, in these type of hybrid structures, a, a review paper by uh, uh, one of my students, uh, Badria Almarshed, uh, actually came out last year that kind of highlights these. Um, there's physical model studies of dune and beach evolutions in the presence of hard structures. There's numerical model studies to assess the effectiveness of hybrid structures. And there's a couple of physical model studies of wave overtopping and overwash of hybrid structures, which is kind of what we're trying to get at with, with this uh, information here that I'm trying to share with you. But there's still a lot of knowledge gaps that need to be uh, addressed. So for example, the effects of different hydrodynamic conditions on the evolution of a hybrid structure. It's not a static system anymore. It's not a wall with, with known you know, uh, overtopping levels, but it's something that evolves over time as a storm progresses. So that needs to be somehow included in the uh, design guidelines that we, we still lack. So that's the bottom point right here. Um, and specifically, the, the impact of that sand cover or the sand component of the system on the performance of the hard structure is not known. I mean, right now, if you were to design something like this, you would simply say, okay, what if the sand is gone completely? How does the structure perform then? But then you would be uh, selling yourself short and probably creating a much too expensive system because the sand does do some work as well. Um, a couple of research objectives, and there's many more. I just wanted to pick out a few so you get a sense for what we're shooting for here. We want to estimate the morphological evolution of a hybrid coastal structure with different sand layer thicknesses and different core systems. So different combinations of sand and hard structure inside. Remember, when you usually build a, a hard structure like a rubble mound, it's the reverse. You have the the, the larger you know size armor units on the outside and the finer in the inside. So now we're basically in a way reversing that uh, to have the dune material outside and the hard material inside. Um, we're interested in evaluating wave overtopping over these structures with the inclusion of the evolution of the dune part essentially. And then ultimately with this uh, one of the research threads here establishing functional relationship between the average and instantaneous overtopping rates and also the geometrical parameters of interest. Um, so we can come up with a formula just like with for uh, regular structures, but include the changing sand layer, which would already help at, at first type of designs of these these, these things. Um, and ultimately, we also would like to improve the numerical modeling approaches to simulate these hybrid coastal structure evolutions. A lot of dune models can already do a portion of this, especially if the hard structure um is is a uh, a flat impermeable surface but if you have a rubble mount it gets a lot trickier because you have to deal with the voids and sand being in the voids or water being in the voids and things eroding and and friction of course changing as you erode the sand so it becomes a little trickier numerically as well all right uh, in terms of methods of how we try to get a first sense of how these hybrids work uh, I want to share a few slides with you on, on 2D wave flume physical model tests that we've conducted at, at our uh, sediment flume in, in Galveston. It's a small you know, wave flume, uh, just about um, 15 meters in length. So, so we can at maximum do a 1 to 20 scale uh, testing of systems, but it has a lot of sand in it and we can put any kind of structure in it. So you can see a setup here uh, with a rubble mound, um, uh, waves, of course, wave paddles, some wave gauges and, and other uh, instruments to measure you know, flow properties, um, and then also instrumentation to measure overtopping, overwash, and so on and so forth, so we can actually address um, what happens during these tests. And here are a couple more images on building a model a hybrid structure in the lab with a sand profile, filter layers underneath, and then different uh, sizes of, of uh, gravel on top and then covered again by sand so you can see the progression of the different materials that are being used in this in this test and um, there's always scaling issues obviously if you have physical model tests that involve sand and moving sediment material so uh, we were using a d50 sand of uh, 0.14 millimeters so that's very fine sand um, but uh, when we're when we're actually scaling this, uh, you know, uh, on a scale level of one to twenty for fruit scaling, we get a, uh, um, a material that's more on the uh, lower range of the of coarse sand material in in the prototype. 
situation, just so you get a feel for what kind of system we would be testing under under model scenario. Um, just a brief overview of some of the test parameters. So these are all irregular waves with uh, you know spectral waves, fairly short duration tests, so we can. Uh, measure the profile uh, very frequently to see how the sand layer changes. And then we're testing, remember, the effect of the thickness of the sand cover. How does that affect overtopping, overwash, and evolution? So we had, in this case, four different sand layer thicknesses between zero, of course, and, and nine centimeters. And then different wave parameters, different water depths, different periods, just to get a first feel of what is important in these um, in this kind of evolution of the uh, the uh, the system. Um, to get a sense for the parameters that we're interested in, we have, of course, our free board. That's the R sub C value that you remember from our overtopping formulas earlier. And then we have the uh, uh, water depth at the toe of the structure, that's H sub T. And as the sand portion of our hybrid erodes, um, obviously the profile changes and those parameters change. The crest um, freeboard changes as the sand layer reduces or the height of it reduces at the top of the structure and also the water depth at the toe of the, uh, the resulting profile uh, changes. So that obviously has an effect on, on how wave overtopping happens, not just in, in some, but also in, in as time progresses throughout a storm. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to capture with this. Um, the way we try to capture this is, is by various means. I mean, we have a cumulative mean of just measuring the amount of sand and water that gets overwashed and overtopped over the crest of the structure by collecting it and filtering it. Um, uh, so we have sand and water separated at the end here. Um, and we can also get some instantaneous measurements using wave gauges and actually uh, um, ADVs with a capability to measure in very shallow flows. Although ADV measurements or acoustic Doppler velocimetry um, in this turbulent, often bubble-laden flow is, of course, uh, tricky at best <laughs> uh, to to do that. So we uh, we use mainly the uh, the more robust measurements of of uh, specifically spaced wave gauges to get a sense for the flow over the structure. And you can see an example of that uh, flow depth over the structure from a measurement. Um, on the bottom left here of the, the presentation. And on the top right, you can see what that would look like over some time. We have these spikes where individual waves overtop the structure uh, and sand is overwashed at the same time as well. You can see in this left image here, the velocities in meter per second um, over time of a long uh, duration of tests. And then here you see the, uh, the actual water depth of the flow um, and if you want some sort of average rate, you can obviously multiply the two if you have accurate measurements of them and, uh, and then get a sense for uh, the overtopping volume. And this is the blue instantaneously, what gets overtopped. And the red dashed line, if you can kind of see it, if you squint really hard at the bottom here, is the average over the entire test uh, flow rate, which of course is quite different, dramatically different because individual waves can bring a lot of water and sand over, and then for a long time there may be nothing, uh, which is often the problem of overtopping formulas to begin with. Um, and you can kind of see the, the integration of the instantaneous rate gives you the uh, the average rate of overtopping. Um, jumping uh, just a little bit to uh, another set of experiments that we did in a larger uh, 3D wave basin, you can kind of see um, a, a, a cross section here that we tested again. It's a rubble mound and a sand layer perched on top of it. You can see waves coming from the right here. You can see the wave maker here, and this is a person, so you can kind of get the sense for the dimensions of this basin. Um, and you can see after running some tests, you know, what this looked like. And here we're really mainly interested in seeing what oblique wave attack uh, of irregular waves would do. Um, for the evolution of the sand cover um, and overtopping under collision and overwash regimes of, of dunes. And in this case, the scaling is, is 1 to 10. Um, and we're looking at, in this case, that you see here, a 17.5 centimeter sand cover thickness as, a, as an example. And you can see some of the uh, setups in the next couple of images. So you get a feel for the type of model testing that were done. This is uh, 
one of my grad students, Altaftaki, building the the uh, rubber mounts, of course, very labor intensive. Um, you can see some ADVs and some, or you know, Vectrinos in this case, and some wave gauges, as well as some overwash and, and overtopping collection uh, channels here. So you get a sense for what we're trying to, to test. And a couple more images on what this may look like um, in a, in a uh, test setup. Now there's a lot of uh, cubic yardage of rock material that was used for armor and filter layers, and then also uh, almost 60 tons of sand that were used in this setup and experiment. And just a few results from this experiment before I jump back to our uh, you know, experiment in the, the small flume, uh, we were able to track how the profile evolves over time and relate that to hydrodynamic conditions, of course. In this case, we simulated an actual storm with increasing water level over time. Um, and then tried this for normal wave attack as well as uh, oblique wave attack because, as uh, you may know, during oblique wave attack, the overtopping is usually much reduced um, because of, on average, because the way the crests hit this structure is not all at the same time. Um, it's it's at certain points and also has a longer uh, path up the structure to actually overtop. So we were interested in in the oblique effect essentially of, of that on our hybrid systems. And you can see also that once the frontal face of this hybrid structure erodes, um, it kind of self protects just like a normal dune would. Material gets moved to the um, subaqueous portion of the profile under the water and helps uh, dissipate energy before the waves can actually reach the structure. So it, it kind of self heals and self protects itself uh, just like a dune would but the hard, hard structure underneath, of course, provides solid uh, protection against uh, you know, water levels and dunes being completely wiped out. Um, and I know due to time, I don't want to go into all the details of this because I want to show you a couple other things. Just wanted to let you know that these data exist and we're uh, trying to numerically model them uh, as well as a next step so we can make better predictions. And this is just, I wanted to show you how we uh, basically ran a storm. So we increased water levels over time um, and then basically tracked the profile, the student scarp retreat, and also any of the other parameters that we're, we were interested in and try to figure out if the beach slope initially made a difference between overtopping uh, and evolution, um, as well as the uh, um, you know other parameters like waves and water levels and such. And this is just a, a quick video hopefully you can see this on your end where you can see how these waves you know impact the structure um, and over time erode the dune layer and expose the hard core and uh, you know basically also reduce overtopping over time by self-protecting essentially um, uh, by moving some material offshore okay we'll jump back real quick to the uh, the 2d um, wave overtopping tests in our in our flume and you know we try to massage that data in such a way that we can actually come up with a similar equation an overtopping equation that can help design such structures and this is of course from small scale but it already gives a, a sense for what can be done with these type of uh, structures and this is based on on dimensional analysis of all the important parameters that we decided and we eliminated some Based on the testing setup and and uh, you know just the uh, um, uh, the fact that some of them didn't change over the, uh, the the testing, but ultimately what you see in the right is the result of of these 200 da seven data points from each experimental run, um, and you see on the y-axis the non-dimensional overtopping rate. Uh, this is average overtopping rate, and on the x-axis you can see a non-dimensional um, number that essentially includes the crest height, the freeboard, and the water depth, those parameters that I um, uh, you know, showed you uh, in the initial um, uh, schematic of, of these type of tests. And uh, they're scaled basically by a, a spectral uh, significant wave height squared to make it non-dimensional. And you can see lots of scatter, obviously, at the uh, um, higher range of this parameter, which means if you have a large freeboard or a large water depth, but small wave heights relatively, 
And that makes sense because then you only may have a few individual waves actually making it over the crest. This is also not critical for the design necessarily, but you can see that statistically that spreads quite a bit. And that's the same for regular structures as well, although not as, as badly as here. But then as you get to lower freeboards and, and elevations of water depth in front of the, uh, the toe, you can see they kind of uh, shrink together um, a little bit more, although keep in mind this is still log scale. But we were able to then uh, come up with a, a design curve, if you will, and this is equation three down here, that looks a lot like the, uh, the van der Meer um, overtopping equation, including the changing uh, sediment um, cover over these uh, hard structures. And then if you fit the parameters to it, you can get an actual quantitative assessment of average overtopping of such a structure. If you're more interested in instantaneous wave overtopping or the wave by wave uh, measures here, um, uh, we have a lot of data points that were analyzed in this case, and we can look at the maximum overtopping rates for an individual wave and then try to fit that to a probabilistic uh, distribution. In this case, a, a two parameter y bull distribution actually fit the data um, best. And just realizing that the maximum um, overtopping or wave by wave instantaneous overtopping rate can be orders of magnitude greater than the average, as you can see again from the comparison of, of these two here um, in, the, in the left image. And then if, if we try to get a, uh, a time dependent volume rate of overtopping, uh, you can kind of see over time as the cumulative volume creeps up, uh, you know, cubic meters uh, per meter of, of uh, length of the structure, um, based on the individual wave overtopping series, we can then create a, a probability distribution essentially. And, and the, uh, the red line is that two parameter Weibull distribution that has a tremendously good fit uh, if we want to create a probability distribution for these individual wave overtopping events, which will help obviously if you're trying to numerically model these, these systems. Okay. Um, I want to be mindful of the time, so I'm, I'm going to shift gears just one more time here um, and show you just a few results from our seashore uh, models based on this Houston-Galveston land barrier concept that I introduced earlier. So remember, the, the Army Corps of Engineers came up with this dual dune design. Um, uh, this is actually uh, what they came up with, a 12-foot high dune first and a 14-foot high dune uh, next, and I'm giving you the metric units here as well. Um, and we're modeling a cross shore profile um, of this with our seashore model. It's a cross shore process based hydrodynamic and morphodynamic model. Um, and it's, it's mainly calibrated with lab and field data on dune erosion and overwash that is available out there. Um, it is uh, you know, capable of including hard bottoms in the uh, computation underneath the sand layer, but um, uh, it cannot quite do the combination of a porous core, like a rubble mound, and the, uh, the sand cover yet. It's just not designed to do that. Um, and at the bottom here, you see a, a water level curve um, for, in this case, Hurricane Ike. Um, where water levels, and this is right near the, the shoreline, increased you know, from around zero to uh, you know, uh, th over three meters, um, essentially, uh, during Hurricane Ike. Um, and you can see what that does to the profile in the numerical model simulations. And the profiles actually stop before the crest of the, the water levels or before the peak of the storm, simply because the seashore model gets unstable when you have dramatic uh, breaching of, of the dune and the erosion. So I, I stopped showing the results here, but basically both of those dunes get wiped out in, in the process of this type of storm. And But this is what right now the Army Corps proposes to protect the entire Houston Galveston region from storm surge. So it's, it's very alarming and, uh, and we're trying to rectify that problem, of course, uh, from a university research perspective. Um, here are just a few more uh, simulations, and we're running many of these uh, as we speak, actually, to try and investigate what can we do better? Can we use hybrid structures to do this? The problem is we don't have a lot of sand. Sand is very expensive. Um, a core that with some cheaper material, maybe clay, maybe some rocks that are cheaply available, 
um, uh, could actually help still reduce the sand volume to uh, something you know, feasible, but also help protect against storms. And previously that was Hurricane Ike that I showed you. That was actually just a 30 year return event. These are now uh, resulting cross-shore profile evolution plots from a 100-year proxy storm plus sea level rise, and we modified the dunes. We made them higher, we included different core structures, um, we made them wider, and like I said, I'm just trying to show you a, a bit the tip of the iceberg of what can be done uh, with these type of systems, and now it actually manages to withstand the entire 100-year a proxy storm with sea level rise um, at a certain level. Heavy erosion, of course. Here you have a core structure. This is the dashed yellow line in the front dune. On the right side, you have a core structure on the back dune. There's benefits and you know drawbacks to both of these configurations. Uh, but ultimately, that's what we're trying to find out. How can we best protect the area and still kind of maintain that you know, proposed dual dune design and the ecological value of having dunes out there, but still provide flood protection at the same time. And that's what basically what I meant uh, with this idea down here that the optimal system obviously does enough flood risk reduction, but also is mindful of the view shed and sand volume constraints that we have in, uh, in our area. All right, just very briefly at the end here, since I'm at 40 minutes, um, just to sum up some of the results um, of the, the 2D wave flume work that I mentioned earlier. Um, of course, the wave overtopping rate decreases as the crest increases or the water depth decreases. That was seen by our formula that we came up with. Um, wave overtopping rates increase, of course, as wave height get, go up or period goes up. That is also similar to normal overtopping uh, on hard coastal structures. Um, the interesting thing was really that the cumulative overtopping rates reduced by up to 20% because of the sand cover effects and the self-healing, self-protecting mechanisms that, that ensue. Um, and, uh, you know, we were able, you know, to see that the uh, wave overtopping rates of these hybrid structures are influenced by a relative freeboard and relative water depth near the toe of the structure. And we included that in our parameter in our non-dimensional equation. And if we want to combine the average and instantaneous overtopping equations, we can actually estimate the total overtop volume during a storm, which is of course important if you're trying to figure out how much does a bay fill up behind such a structure so you can do internal setup calculations uh, and, and see what kind of in-bay protection you may need to prevent storm surge damage. And uh, lastly, just a couple of take home messages and general food for thought for you to further discuss or ask questions about, obviously. Um, I think uh, that sand covered hard structures such as rubble mounds or others can be a viable hybrid alternative to traditional coastal structures, especially if dune aesthetics are desirable but you know, the pure dunes may not be strong enough and hard coastal structures are needed to reliably prevent uh, you know, flooding um, during storm surge impact. Um, also, I haven't mentioned this explicitly, but these hybrid systems align really well with uh, engineering with nature concepts that the Army Corps of Engineers is, is pushing more and more in the US and provide a certain level of flexibility that a pure hard structure does not have because you can change the thickness of sand layer much easier than, than anything else. But of course, all this needs testing at larger scales and better numerical treatment of the whole system. Um, there are sand cover evolution effects on overtopping rates during storm impact, and these are important. Uh, initially, actually, the overtopping, I don't know if you saw this, and I, I may not have mentioned it explicitly, but the overtopping very briefly increases because of the sand uh, layer um, basically providing almost like a ramp uh, for the water to run up and overtop the structure, um, but ultimately reduces dramatically uh, as the sand layer erodes and, and uh, provides uh, protection by um, tripping wave energy essentially further away from the structure. Um, the thing is though, these initial increases are not going to happen in the prototype in reality because storms slowly uh, even if it's over a couple of hours, increase in water level and, and wave energy. So at that point, before overtopping even happens, 
the profile adjustment would have already, you know, commenced that self-healing effect. Uh, and something that is of importance for all coastal structures is a toe scour. Do you always have to protect against that? The effect of having sand actually on top of the structure will actually, uh, you know, be beneficial for toe scour because you always have enough uh, volume available to uh, prevent significant toe scour. At least that's what we saw from our numerical and, and physical model uh, testing. All right, what's next? Um, we're investigating in detail the fundamental interaction processes between the sand dune and the coarse rock matrix. So if you have a rubble mound, what happens in the voids of those rocks and how is energy dissipated? How is the profile changing? This is actually a dissertation topic by one of my students right now. Um, and we're trying to continue to test at larger scales also and with different materials. Um, full scale prototypes are actually being uh, discussed and developed right now along the Galveston coastline because that would be a, an integral component of the Houston Galveston storm surge or Ike Dyke structure. Um, and we continue to try, uh, you know, improve those functional design criteria and formulas, whether they're through empirical formulations or numerical treatment or, you know, more uh, machine learning type applications. Um, and then ultimately, improving numerical modeling of hybrid systems with rubble mount cores is another branch of the research aspects that are uh, currently happening with volume of fluid, you know, detailed models, as well as process-based kind of simple or more empirical more, um, models. And then last but not least, it's all about cost savings, maintenance of these structures, and how do we deal with storm sequences? You know, if dunes get wiped out and not rebuilt, maybe hybrids can be the solution that still have some uh, leftover resiliency against uh, sequences of storms that may be more important in the future. All right, I'm at 45 minutes on my count here. So uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share some of this research with you guys. I'd like to thank, um, you know, Alec for inviting me and all of you for attending. Um, also, some thanks go out, obviously, to the people that help with the various projects here that were included and the funding agencies, of course, that have made this possible. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. And uh, I'm uh, opening the floor for any questions. I'll uh, get out of the presentation mode here so I can see if there's any comments. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Jens, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I see one hand rise, uh, Roger. I don't know if you have a question. Yes, please, if there's any questions, if you want to unmute yourself and or, or use the text chat, I can see those now, so. Empezamos con Roger y seguimos con Gabriela. Si nos escucha Roger. En lo que, en lo que Roger Resuelve su problema técnico. Si quieres empezar, Gabriela, con tu pregunta. Hey, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear and see you. How are you? Okay, thanks a lot for your presentation, James. It was very interesting. I was just curious if uh, is it possible to add some of this dune vegetation to this uh, final hybrid uh, structure? Um, would it... Uh, help to reduce the sediment loss during these overwash events? And have you done any experiment, uh, either physical or numerical, to consider the uh, effect? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for the question. And then uh, just briefly, if I understand correctly, you're asking about dune vegetation, correct? Yeah. On, on, yeah. So, um, we're kind of still at the initial stages of, of trying to investigate the, the interaction simply of the sediment with the uh, the hard core. So I haven't done any tests yet with vegetation. I have done vegetated dune physical model tests as well as some numerical tests um, where we clearly show that the vegetation has an effect. And, and, you know, usually dunes are being vegetated, engineered dunes as part of the uh, requirements for projects. Um, specifically for the uh, the Houston Galveston, the, the long you know uh, storm surge suppression system that will include some form of dunes, 
Um, the specs already include that they have to be vegetated with uh, native dune species that, you know, with their roots will, will, you know, help, you know, not just against the erosion, but also help trap uh, sediment and continue to grow or maintain the dunes, uh, you know, rather than having them bare uh, sand dunes because they tend to disappear much quicker. Um, I, I'm certainly in the future, I can see tests where we add vegetation just like we've done before um, to our dunes with the cores. And it's basically a, a portion of the uh, design also because the, uh, the vegetation needs a certain depth of sand to be viable, right? So uh, it becomes a criteria in how thick the sand layer should be. Um, there's other criteria. Um, I'm sure you're probably dealing with similar issues on the, the Yucatan side of the Gulf, uh, for example, turtle nesting and, and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you cannot build anything if it, if it prevents turtles from uh, nesting on the beach in, in Texas. And so uh, this was actually another uh, reason why uh, we think these hybrid systems that can save space, because we don't have much space on the coast in, in Texas, um, everywhere else, we have plenty of space, but not on the coast. And, and so they, you know, still providing the ecological functionality of the dune, but also the much needed storm surge protection. So, but I know I'm kind of trailing off, but the, uh, the question on the vegetation, I think it's going to be important. Um, in other research, I, you know, we've shown up to, uh, you know, over 30% increased resistance against erosion. If you think about erosion volume or dune scarp retreat, just by having natural vegetation grow on the sand dune. So I'm, I'm assuming that still remains a similar aspect in, in this type of system. That is an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, any other question from the audience? Please raise your hand or put the question in the chat. In the meantime, uh, I will just, I have a, one question, one, no, two, two, two quick questions. The first one is that, uh, is, I mean, one of the, the main, yeah, advantages of uh, natural dunes is their capability to naturally recover after a storm event. So the first one is, I mean, looking at your, for example, at your uh, picture from your uh, first slide, I mean, if it, it looks like this, at least for this example, you need to to do the that um, what won't, 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 won't happen naturally, right? Uh, but maybe not in other cases it could be. So basically my question is how many effort on investigating this capability of these hybrid uh, solutions to naturally recover and uh, decrease the maintenance cost mm -hmm. uh, has been done. And the other is regarding your um, uh, overtopping formulations. What do you think is the next step in terms of the variables that you have in those equations to, to, to be able to make it not, I, we, we know that there is no universal overtopping formulation, but at least depending on the on the hybrid uh, structure at each site to to be able to use it without being so specific so that will be my my two questions mm -hmm. all right thank you alec for the for those two questions let me uh, you know try to address the first one in terms of recovery of of dunes and and hybrids in general there has specifically on the hybrid part that hasn't been any research on on this um, that I'm aware of at least and as you as you know it's much easier to uh, whether numerically or physically or in any situation to model something that is very intense with large volume changes and over short duration <clears throat> so the erosion or the storm impact has been the focus um, it's the most dramatic profile change on the coast and uh, it takes place over just a few hours or maybe days, right? So we can model it with fairly high resolution numerical systems and we can simulate it in, in uh, you know, physical models uh, with a reasonable amount of time. Um, the uh, recovery of dunes is a little trickier 
because it, it happens over many, many, many years. And only if there's no storm in between to, uh, you know, reverse it again. So it's much, you know, for example, estimates to, you know, fully recover a dune on the Texas coast or other coasts, for example, is between five and 10 years. And that's only if enough sediment is available in the, uh, you know, wet and dry part of the beach, the berm to actually have aeolian transport processes move that sediment into the dune. It then also has to be captured by something on the dune, vegetation or some elevation change to actually trap the sediment and then form a dune. So in that regard, I actually think the hybrid structures could recover quicker than normal dunes because you have the hybrid, the core already there as the mechanism to trap sediment uh, after it has been exposed, just like the uh, the rubble mount that you see in the in the image. Uh, so that I actually don't think is a um, a negative aspect of the uh, hard uh, core inside those hybrid things. I actually think it, if the mechanism is there to move aeolian material into or landward, then you have something like a, a sand fence that people use that that traps the material right away. If there's only a pure dune that has been completely breached or wiped out, you, you don't even have that to start the new dune again. So I, I actually think that could be beneficial, but uh, to go back to the example of the Houston Galveston uh, storm surge suppression system, uh, there has been some uh, long-term modeling done on, on this. It's very simplified, but it, it essentially, um, you know, shows that every six to seven years, the nor the natural dunes, those those small ones that they came up with, would have to be uh, renourished completely. And this is based on the fact that storm frequency recurrence intervals and and those sort of things, uh, they would just be wiped out frequently and then have to be renourished. So that has those maintenance costs are an important factor that that need to be explored with much more detailed modeling and, and investigation. It's it's a critical point actually because when those things get built, somebody pays for putting it there and then they hand it over to the local agency to manage and, and then all of a sudden they have all these extra costs if, if it needs to be you know maintained over over the years. So that's for one, I think the hybrids help in trapping sediment and rebuilding if the mechanisms exist. Sometimes there's just the mechanism just doesn't exist and you have to do it manually. Um, and second of all, yeah, it's very important to have that maintenance aspect uh, considered. And uh, you asked about the uh, um, equations, you know, the empirical equations for um, overtopping and what kind of, if I understand correctly, what the next steps would be to, uh, you know, get further at this. Uh, well, we only had a limited amount of tests and these are small scale physical model tests. So what we really want to do is expand the number of, of tests and test at different scales and also be able to numerically test because then we can expand the number of cases, of course, that we do. As you can imagine, this is very labor intensive to set up these tests and rebuild and measure because you have different materials you have to clean and set up. Obviously, it takes a lot of time. Um, but I think some of the next steps would be to, uh, you know, test with different wave and water level scenarios. That's the easiest thing to change, but then also to test different cores. And that's actually what we're doing right now because a, a clay dike underneath sand cover behaves much differently than a, a rubble mound underneath a sand cover. And a Reinforced concrete T-wall behaves much different than a, uh, you know, a, a rubble mound. So um, being able to see what range of empirical formula you can actually use. And then ultimately, if the numerical modeling can be, you know, improved so it can predict the overtopping and overwash and the evolution of the sand layer, um, you know, in a, in a healthy manner, uh, then that would be the way to design these things. It's it's not very often that these empirical overtopping formulas are used for final designs when you have a moving bed in there. That's the difficulty in it. But as a first approximation, or even uh, with large-scale storm surge modeling, when people use broad-crested weir 
formulas to decide how much water goes over a structure. This type of empirical equation could be coupled with these large scale, let's say, at Zurich and Swan type modeling of flooding. And then uh, you could have a more realistic entry of water into a base system over, over such hybrid structures by at least having an empirical equation. Um, so there's many ways that these can be used. Uh, for, for my side, I think there's a lot of more scenarios that we need to test to have a more robust equation that we could, we could then uh, couple with larger scale flooding uh, simulations. Thanks. Any other question from the audience? Jose? Yeah, I can see. Oh, sir. Hi. How are you, Jose? Hi. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but how do you design the size of the rock? Because when you don't have uh, sand over, the the height is is big. It depends on the on the weights. Yeah, that's a good question. That's actually one of the research questions I had in there, right? So, what is the uh, what is the uh, in a different a different formulation? But it's basically a, what is the effect on design of a rubble mound, for example? Can you design it with smaller rocks, right, or make it lower because you have sand available in the profile? And uh, the the answer is still it depends, <laughs> of course. Um, it, it depends on how much the rubble mount is exposed. If it is a rubble mount, um, it depends on uh, you know how much damage of your rubble mount structure you're willing to accept uh, in in such a process. So uh, if you're going completely, um, let's say conservative approach, as I mentioned in the presentation, you would say, okay, let's let's say the sand doesn't exist. There's just a beach and then a rubble mound. Then you have to size the rubble mound elements with you know something like a Hudson equation that that has been used for you know decades to size certain armor units against wave attack, for example, so they don't move as as waves uh, impact them. Um, my sense is that the uh, we need to figure out better how much the actual wave um, design wave at the structure is reduced because we have the sediment in the profile. So it, the sediment basically reducing energy by dissipating wave energy further offshore, making a wider surf zone and those sort of things. Um, so the, uh, the way that is currently done, and this is from some of the Dutch designs that they did, they use process-based models and basically use a, a summer and a winter profile, if you will, of, of eroded sand or not eroded sand, and then run their wave models uh, over top of these fixed profiles to see what the design waves are at the structure. And the, the armor units can be reduced in size because of the fact that the winter profile does dissipate some of the design uh, wave energy. But it's it's tricky uh, to do that because, you know, the the evolution of the sand profile is, is still, engineers that design hard structures are not used to using a, a moving bed or, or dune in their design. They want a fixed uh, structure. And for this type of idea to make it into actual design codes, there's still a long way, long way to go. But it's, it's an excellent question. It's actually one that I'm, I'm trying to, to find out with you know, the course of the research. I, I think it, there will be a reduction in, in cost savings by yeah. considering the sand. Thank you so much. There are there are a couple of questions in the chat. I don't know if you are able to. Yes, yeah, there's the one uh, dissipating wave energy using reef like structures offshore to achieve a non so critical wave condition on uh, the shore possible. Um, absolutely there. I mean, any type of um, offshore structure that can uh, reduce the wave impact is, is always possible. It's ultimately a cost issue um, and also a, a hazard issue. A lot of times people are hesitant in putting more structures somewhere where you have boats and 
people that swim and that sort of stuff um, uh, in there. But it's being done. I'm actually part of a project right now where we're trying to design a, an offshore uh, submerged breakwater, essentially, to mitigate a, an erosional hotspot on Galveston um, for, you know, that would ultimately be part of a, a coastal spine system to uh, protect against storm surge. So usually, you know, remember in, in the case that I presented, they're talking about 100 kilometers of coastline and, and building a submerged structure for that distance. A hard structure is, of course, very costly. So they're trying to, you know, uh, you know, do this on the coast, on the beach profile, it will be a massive sand nourishment, but I don't think they will, in this case, try to put a, a hard structure along the entire stretch, you know, under underwater. But it's it's definitely possible, but usually more on the local, uh, you know, more confined area. Um, you said, and there's a follow-up question, I guess, how effective are reef structures in low energy environments like the Yucatan uh, shelf? Well, it depends on what your objective is with reef structures, right? Uh, and it, it depends on the uh, the sediment movement, so this, the whole sediment budget of, of your area. If the idea is to, uh, to create, let's say, a, a tombolo or a sill or connection between the reef structure and the beach or build out the beach you have to design them in a certain way if the intent is mainly to reduce wave energy during a big storm event or i guess you get our cold fronts that move from north to south uh, through the us then over the gulf and they become your your uh, el nortes uh, on your end um, then it's a different a different objective um, I, you're talking about low energy environments uh, if that means you're you're basically trying to influence sedimentation patterns um, if there's very low energy then there's also not as much movement of sediment um, then you may be better off building some uh, more groin like uh, structures if you want to trap sediment but if you really want to break wave energy i think uh, they they can be very effective but expensive and, and can create hazards. So you always have to weigh those options. Thank you, Jens. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, just, just a last one from my side. Uh, what do you think about the dunes uh, with a core of a job textile field of sand that has, well, it became popular in some in some projects here in Mexico? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's actually one that we've discussed in our project team uh, over the last couple of months and weeks uh, quite intensively. Um, uh, especially since some of the local residents were asking, you know, Galveston, that is, uh, what about geotextiles? They, uh, geotubes have been used in shore protection um, on the Texas coast, as well as other places uh, in the U.S. and, and abroad. Um, and they, they can work, but they also can fail very ugly. And, and that has happened quite a few times in Texas. Um, the problem is that if you have the, the problem is along the Gulf Coast in many places that the difference between normal conditions and design storm conditions is huge. You have basically a lake most of the time and then you have a hurricane and uh, and these geotubes, you know, they're static. They cannot move or adjust. And when a storm hits them, erodes the sand around them and exposes them. They look like very ugly beached whales and and also are hard to uh, to fix after they have failed. And the only um, benefit that they provide is for a very tiny range of of storm um, intensity. So if the storm is very low, then yes, they function, but then a normal dune without them would also function. <laughs> and if the storm is is very high, then everything gets wiped out and the, the geotubes don't really do much to, to reduce that impact in flooding and damage. And that small range that they actually provide an actual flood reduction benefit is usually not enough to, uh, you know, for the 
to to warrant the cost of of making them and also having to replenish them or redo them if they fail. So the Army Corps is, at least from what I understand in my discussions with them, moving away from the, uh, designing with those, especially along the Gulf Coast, because of some of those failures that have just looked very ugly. Um, but I mean, they're like sandbags, right? They 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 help to some extent, but it 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 makes it it may be easier to have a rubble mound or something in there that you can cover again because then you can pick up individual pieces and and you don't have to you know cut fabric, pull it out, and try to fill it again. It, it's just a lot more intensive, labor intensive. Okay, thank you, Jens for your time and for such a nice talk. And uh, I hope everything goes well for uh, in Germany during your sabbatical. Thank you so much, Alec. Like I said, thank you for inviting me to this talk. And uh, good luck, everybody. Stay healthy. And uh, I hope we'll, uh, we'll be able to meet in person sometime again soon. Thanks for all the questions also. Very, very good questions. Thank you. Gracias a todos. All right, take care.